Today is December 8th. It's the 334th day of the year, and this is the On This Day podcast. In the early morning hours on this day in 1980, John Lennon is in the recording studio with his wife and collaborator Yoko Ono, working on material for the follow-up to their newly released album Double Fantasy. Double Fantasy receives a rather lukewarm reception when it's released three weeks earlier, but very soon it will reach the top of the charts, and the following year it will win the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. It's the first album Lennon has made in a long time, He takes a five-year break from the music business after the birth of his second son, Sean, to focus on being a father, something he neglected to do with his first son, Julian. Julian is born in 1963, a month after the first Beatles album, Please Please Me, comes out. John doesn't know what to make of Julian, and he's hardly around anyway. Beatlemania explodes in the UK and soon thereafter in the US, and John Lennon becomes one of the most famous people in the world. But when Sean is born in 1975, John is in a very different place in his life. Sean is born on John's birthday, October 9th, and to John, it feels like they're twins. He can relate to Sean in a way he never could or never tried to with Julian. But after five years as a stay-at-home dad, John Lennon is overcome by creative urges that are so familiar to him. He begins writing songs furiously, inspired by the songs Yoko writes, which are inspired by the songs John writes, and it just continues in an endless loop like that. Together, they have enough material for two albums when they record Double Fantasy. So instead of taking a break after the release of their latest album, They continue working on the previously recorded songs and new songs, such as Walking on Thin Ice, a Yoko Ono song they're mixing on this day in 1980 at the Record Plant Recording Studio. Around three in the morning on this day, everyone in the studio is getting a bit fried. Engineer Steve Marcantonio has been up for nearly 20 hours straight and he can barely keep his eyes open. Producer Jack Douglas calls a break, and Mark Antonio decides to step outside for some fresh air to wake up for the next few hours. It's freezing cold in New York City this morning. Mark Antonio grabs his coat and tells the others he's stepping out for a short walk. John tells him, I'm coming with you. The two of them step outside onto West 44th Street and head towards 8th Avenue. John tells Mark Antonio stories of when the Beatles came to New York getting chased by a group of guys who were mad that their girls were flirting with the Fab Four. A trip down memory lane, this would have been 15, 16 years earlier, but for John, it probably feels like a lifetime. They return to the studio for a few more hours, and then John and Yoko head home to their apartment at the Dakota around 6 a.m. The freezing cold morning gives way to an unusually mild and warm Monday in New York. At 11 a.m., photographer Annie Leibovitz arrives at the Dakota to photograph Lennon for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. The Dakota is an exclusive co-op apartment building on Manhattan's Upper West Side. It's a nearly 100-year-old building located on the corner of 72nd and Central Park West. And it's well known as the home to creative types and the who's who on the art and culture scene. Leibovitz takes one of the four corner elevators up to the apartment Lennon shares with Yoko and Sean and sets up to take the cover shot. Lennon has just returned home from the barbershop where he gets his hair done in a 1950s teddy boy style and he's all ready for the photo shoot. Rolling Stone magazine is only interested in Lennon for the cover, but John is only interested in being photographed with Yoko. Despite her best efforts to get a solo shot, Leibovitz takes a photograph of a naked John Lennon lying on the floor in a fetal position with his arms and legs wrapped around his wife Yoko, who is dressed all in black. And the photographer promises him that this photo will be on the cover of the magazine. 
The photo session wraps up, and soon after Leibovitz leaves, a radio crew from RKO Radio in San Francisco arrives to do an interview with Lennon around 12.40 p.m. The interview covers all aspects of John's life. The new record, his hiatus, his children, Yoko, the Beatles, speaking particularly about when he meets Paul McCartney for the first time and chooses him as a collaborator. And also in the interview, John talks about the essence of his personal philosophy, which he writes about in the songs Give Peace a Chance and Imagine. But imagine, there was a time, you know, when you didn't have to have a passport to go from country to country. What kind of world do we create? Really, it used to be you could go around, you know. What is this game that you can't get, that somehow this is America and then just across the, the field is Canada and that you have to have all kinds of papers and pictures and stamps and passports and the concept of imagining no countries, imagining no religion, not imagining no God. Although you're entitled to do that too. Imagining no denominations. Imagining that we re- revere Jesus Christ, Mohammed, Krishna, Milarepa equally. We don't have to worship e- either one that we don't have to, but we imagine there's no Catholic Protestant. In the late afternoon, John and Yoko leave the Dakota to head back to the record plant for a listen to the mix they worked on earlier in the day. As they walk out of the archway on the south side of the Dakota, the 72nd Street entrance, they encounter a group of fans looking for autographs. This is an everyday occurrence for Lennon. Fans gathered outside the Dakota just to be physically near the place where John Lennon is looking up at the gables and the balconies of the building, wondering which windows are his. What's he doing in there? Every day, people stand on 72nd Street outside the Dakota, looking up and wondering. And they still do, every day, all these years later, only now wondering what it was like, and looking at the entrance and trying to imagine how it all happened. John Lennon is always gracious, always willing to sign an autograph. He knows the fans have been waiting for a long time, for just a brief moment of his time. As John signs autographs this evening, one fan who's flown all the way from Hawaii to meet John Lennon holds out a copy of the Double Fantasy album. John signs the album and hands it back, asking, Is this all you want? The fan smiles and nods. Lennon bids the group farewell and climbs into the waiting limousine next to Yoko. At the record plant, they listen back to the mix of Walking on Thin Ice. They make some final adjustments, and then the song is finished. A tape copy of the mix is made that John takes with him when they leave. They hop in their limo on 44th Street around 10.30. Yoko suggests they stop at the stage deli for dinner. But John wants to go back to the Dakota first to see Sean before he goes to bed. At 10.45 p.m., the limo turns onto 72nd Street and comes to a stop in front of the Dakota. Yoko gets out of the car and walks to the building. John follows her, carrying the tape of the mix they worked on at the studio. As he walks into the large, two-story archway, some people hear someone call out, Mr. Lennon. Five gunshots ring out, and John Lennon is hit by four of the bullets, two in his back and two in his shoulder. He stumbles up the steps into a small reception area and collapses. I'm shot. I'm shot, he says. Lennon is lying face down in the vestibule when police arrive a few minutes later. They recognize the severity of his injuries and don't even wait for an ambulance. They pick Lennon up, place him in the back seat of a police car, and race to St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. Just before 11 p.m., the police officers carry Lennon through the doors at Roosevelt and into the emergency room. He has no pulse and is not breathing, but doctors try to revive him for 15 minutes. The damage is done, and there's no saving him. John Lennon is pronounced dead at 11.15 p.m., on this day in 1980.